Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Eric Maskin from the School of Social Science, and I'd like to welcome you to this year's Leon Levy Lecture. This is now the sixth annual Levy Lecture, uh, an event which uh, has come to be a real highlight in the Institute's academic calendar. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that uh, past lectures have varied widely in topic. Uh, so uh, one year we heard about uh, how taxi drivers decide when to knock off work for the day. And uh, another year we found out why dueling, uh, which was viewed as immoral and as certainly illegal, throughout Europe, nevertheless flourished there for over three centuries. And a couple of years ago, uh, we learned why Calvinists worked so hard even though they believed in predestination. <laughs> so uh, the lecture has ranged widely, which befits the man uh, in whose honor the lecture was established, Leon Levy who uh, most of you know was a great investor, a great philanthropist, and a great friend to the Institute for Advanced Study. At the IAS, he was a longtime trustee, president of the board, and chairman of the investment committee. Leon was uh, certainly an extraordinarily successful investor, but his Success depended on his intuitive understanding of the psychology of the market. He didn't at all believe in fancy analysis. Uh, as a friend of his once said, to Leon, an analyst is a trained professional paid to guess wrong about the market, and a technical analyst is a trained professional paid to use computers to guess wrong about the market. But one thing Leon did believe in was giving talented people the opportunity to apply and develop their talents. And that's, uh, that's why I think um, he was such a strong supporter of the Institute, of Rockefeller University, of the Guggenheim Foundation, and many other institutions. And I believe he would have been very interested in what today's Levy lecturer, Rohini Somanathan, has to say about providing opportunity. Rohini is the Leon Levy Foundation member in the School of Social Science for the year, and she received her bachelor's and master's degrees from Delhi University and her PhD from Boston University. She taught at Emory, the, in the Indian Statistical Institute and the University of Michigan before rejoining Delhi as a reader in economics in 2005, and since 2008 she's been professor of economics there. She's known for her work in economic development, political economy, and public economics. And today she will speak on scheduling caste, state-shaped identity, and inequality in India. Rohini. Thank you very much, Eric, and thank you all for being here. Um, it's an honor to speak here before you, and I'm especially grateful to the Leon Levy Foundation for both this opportunity and the past year, uh, which has allowed me to think much more deeply about these issues than I would have otherwise. Um, so let me start with a few words explaining the somewhat obscure title of the talk. Uh, what does it mean to schedule caste? Uh, so a schedule is just a list appended to a major act, and there were many schedules appended to the Indian Constitution that detailed, elaborated, or qualified certain provisions. And the term scheduled castes first appeared in the Government of India Act in 1935. And it referred to, and this is quoting from the Act, castes, races, tribes, 
which appear to his majesty in council to correspond to the classes of persons formerly known as depressed classes. So this is uh, under the, when India was still ruled by the crown. And the census uh, describes depressed classes as those contact with whom entails purification on the part of high caste Hindus. So the, these groups were enumerated in the 1931 census, before that as well, but most carefully in the 1931 census, because they were denied access to temples, wells, schools, and it was believed that by identifying them, uh, one could enable their political representation and raise them, quote, from their current backward position to one more, more nearly comparable with that of other more advanced social groups. So uh, that, was the, that was the idea. <coughs> and the Government of India Act was the, was the major act which ushered in a devolution of power, and that's why political decentralization really came with the act. What did these schedules look like? Uh, pretty much like this. this. Neither of these are really schedules uh, that appeared as part of the act, but they were just lists that looked very much like this. So the one on the left is from the 1931 census, uh, and it just lists what are called exterior castes, which was the name that depressed classes had, um, had got by that time. So you just see on the left, just small print really, but the leftmost column is just a set of castes. Uh, in the center, the next column gives the numbers. The next one tells you where in the country they're scheduled. And this was something very particular about this strategy. Scheduling was not for the country, it was for a region. It could be a district, it could be a state, it could be part of a district. And so it was very local. And then you have remarks. Um, so, for example, the first one says, Barber castes elsewhere not considered as exterior. So the same group could be considered deserving of affirmative action or preferential treatment in one part of the country, in one part of the state, but not in another. Uh, and this is a list uh, after independence, and this is a little bit different in that basically it had castes, and again it said, the, the caste lists were all done by state, and within each state it said, so the first one says, throughout the state except Hyderabad, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so it was very local, and that's going to be important. Uh, so in um, the list of exterior castes, we find 278 castes in 1931. That's 11% of the population of India at the time which changed, boundaries changed, and so it's hard to interpret these percentages as changes over time um, in numbers. Um, it, there were 278 castes, it was 11% of the population, and all religions uh, were eligible to have castes counted as exterior. So even though it was thought of as fundamentally springing from the way the Hindu ritual system operated, uh, if you were a caste and you converted, you were still a caste and uh, that was how you were treated uh, in the colonial period. After independence, only Hindu, Buddhist, and Sikh religions could have their castes enumerated as scheduled castes. So the others were not eligible for preferential treatment, and when we talk about caste and inequality, this is important because there was this bias in there from the start. So what, what was the chronology like? Well, the first scheduling was in 1935, and you had a list of scheduled castes. Um, 1950 to 51, the constitution was written in 1950, and the lists were drawn up in 1951. And what they did at the time was take these lists from 1935 and use them and add on a few castes, and split these lists into two categories. One were castes that were within the Hindu system, and the other list was a list of tribes some of whom were included in the previous lists. So they were the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes, and the main provisions were quotas for representation in parliament, um, and the, the, that was a constitutional provision. So it was required that seats in parliament be reserved for these groups in proportion to their share in the population. You had other provisions that were considered enabling provisions because the numbers were not spelt out and the laws were not spelt out in the constitution, which said that nothing, nothing prevented the state uh, 
from providing preference to these groups in education and employment. So that was the second type of provision. And you had basically population-based quotas very quickly came in for, for parliamentary seats, but also in universities and in public employment. So this was a very large affirmative action program. It was probably the largest affirmative action program in the world at that time and has since grown larger. Uh, in 1955, there were agitations based on groups claiming that they should have been in but were left out. So a commission was appointed. It was called the first Backward Classes Commission to create a list of other backward classes that were not included in these lists. 1976, the sh you had these territorial restrictions I talked about among the scheduled castes. So most of these territorial restrictions were removed. If you were previously scheduled in one part of the state, you were now scheduled throughout the state. So that happened in 1976. 1978, you had a second backward classes commission, because even though you had this commission in 1955, nothing really happened as a result of that commission. No new laws were brought in place. In 1978, you had the second backward classes commission, and this was extremely controversial because the backward classes listed were 2,399 caste groups, and they were 50% of the population. And so when the question of reserving seats for this, these groups came, came on the table, you had wide-scale protests because public universities would have fewer and fewer seats for uh, open admissions. And this was, uh, so people set fire to themselves, there were riots, a lot, a lot happened in 1980 when this came on the table. It was then shelved. And in 1990, uh, quotas were, Sorry, it says 1980 there. In 1990, quotas were brought in for the other backward classes, 27% of all government jobs in the federal government were going to be given to other backward classes. In 2008, and this is where I was directly concerned because uh, we had to allot 27% to other backward classes. So the scheduling of caste is, in some sense, at the center of a strategy towards removing inequality or group-based inequality in India. And part of what I'd like to do today is reflect both on what it has done, what it could have done, and how we make sense of what it has done. So that's, that's, the, that's the objective. So it's with some reservation that an economist will stand and speak about caste. Um, Eustace Kitts, the first compendium of caste, was made in 1885 by Eustace Kitts. And he said that the study of caste was not, people were not graveled by the lack of material, he says, but by its volume and the lack of rational arrangement. Uh, so I think anyone who's worked on caste is overwhelmed by both the volume of material and the lack of rational arrangement. And I will try to take away from this volume of material very particular things that are useful for the case that I'm going to try and make. So what, uh, uh, what is some of the work on caste that's actually been very important and I draw on um, extensively, even though I present very little of it in this lecture. So caste was studied to study the structure of village communities. It was studied in relation to colonial power. It was studied as a way in which individuals moved in societies that were structured in a particular way. And more recently, it's been studied intensely as the new face of politics in India. And in general, one example of ethnic politics. So it's studied as part of what's looked at now as a secular move away from secular politics. In economics, there's now a sizable empirical literature on caste. Most of this literature, though, has taken scheduled castes as a group and looked to see whether they've done better or worse as a result of affirmative action policies. And so what I'm going to do here, in a sense, is neither in this direction nor in that. It's really to put the two together. It's to try and take the details from the first literature, but then try and break down the caste category, the scheduled caste category down into smaller groups and ask who really benefited within the scheduled castes and how do we understand these changes. 
And are there alternatives to quotas which now, looking forward, might be more efficient or more just, given the Indian setting? So while I will be using a general framework to make the argument, my argument is not going to be a general argument. It's going to be an argument really about the Indian context. How, given a particular structure, if we map the details of India into this structure, what do we get? And what does that tell us about what's going on? So that's my particular, very modest objective here. So what are the steps in the argument that I'm going to make? I'm going to start off with a model of allocating scarce positions. So the idea is that there are a number of scarce positions. They could be jobs. They could be seats in a university. And we want to think about what are just allocations and what are efficient allocations. And that's, that's what we're interested, I'm interested in here. And so what I do is first set up a model that allows me to compare quotas with other types of allocations. Um, and using this, I show when quotas can actually enhance efficiency and equality. So when quotas are actually a good thing. So that's the next step. Then I'll show that these results actually break down. And this is the sense in which I'm using a general model, but I'm making a specific argument with that model. So I'm going to show that these results break down if the categories that we have for purposes of affirmative action are fewer, far fewer, than the number of groups in society. And as you could have see, would have seen by what's already gone, there were many, many, many more groups than could have been feasible categories for affirmative action. So that's where this comes in. So I'll show that these results break down with fewer categories than groups. And of course, if there are mistakes in classification, then you do worse than you would without the mistakes. But that's an important part of the story, because part of what I'll argue is that mistakes in classification were inevitable, given the way that caste was scheduled. Um, so I start off with the model. I'll then give some background to the representation of caste in India. Why were there so many? Why did we have thousands rather than two? or you know, until recently, four in the, or five in the uh, US census. Why did we have so many? Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about inequality in educational att attainment. So if we look within the group of scheduled castes, how heterogeneous were they? There were these many groups, were they, were, but were they substantially many? Were they many in terms of disadvantage? So that's the third part. And then finally, I'll conclude by thinking about alternatives. Can other policies be either effectively combined with quotas or should they, to some extent, replace them? And I'll argue that yes. And I'll give some evidence. Um, so here's, here's the model. Um, so I'll talk through it. You don't really, there's nothing really technical in it. But uh, I could have probably said this more simply, but I'd need some training. I haven't got there yet. Uh, so there are two groups. And what's important is that these two groups are identical in their distribution of ability, but they're different in the resources that they have had access to. So it's not that everybody within a group is the same, but it's just that the distribution of ability is the same across groups. So there is some distribution, and this bell curve is a standard way to look at it. Alternatively, you can think that for all levels of ability, people are uniformly spread out across levels of ability. It doesn't matter. I will move back and forth between the two. This is computationally easier, and that's visually nicer. So when I'm showing you numbers, I'll use this. And when I'm, when I'm trying to put forward an idea, I'll go back to a picture that maybe uses the one on the left. So there's an identical distribution of ability. So each person then has a group identity and has an ability. And the group identity determines what resources they have available to them, what schools they went to, you know, what their neighborhood was like, whatever you want. And here, even though I use ability, ability could be anything. It could be ability plus a bunch of other things, including some resources. Ability, when I talk about its distribution, is just talking about that which doesn't vary across groups, whereas resources here are things that vary across groups. And that's really the only difference. All right, so now coming back to the uniform distribution, um, there are two groups, and group two has a higher level of resources. So the idea is people have some ability and they have some resources. And together, these two things determine their score. 
or how, or their skill, if you want. S will do for both. All right. So think about it as a school transcript. Think about it as a score in an entrance exam. It doesn't really matter. It's something that measures what you know and how talented you are. Okay. So there's ability. There's scores that depends on ability and resources. And then the third thing, and there's no more, that's the only, it's the only one left, is performance or productivity. So you have this distribution of ability. Remember, we started off with just this one for everyone. And now, if we look at the distributions of scores, then scores, in this case, I've taken a very simple formulation where scores are just, um, it should have been just ability plus resources. Sorry, that should be an R. So what, what scores do, then the distribution of scores is shifted to the right simply by the, by the difference in resources of the second group relative to the first group. So in this region, scores overlap for the two groups. This is only for group one, and this is for group two. And now we can think about allocations in terms of which scores for which group are going to get into these positions, are going to get the jobs or the seats. Now, suppose that productivity, and now all that I'm assuming <coughs> is that when we look at performance, when you're in the factory or when you're you know, doing your research or whatever, whatever the context is, your performance depends not only on your score, but depends additionally on your ability. And that's an important assumption. So the idea is we're born with something, we are given a bunch of things that determines how we do. But this score that people can measure doesn't tell you everything about how people do. Ability matters in addition. And that's going to be an important part of this. Okay? Um, because if scores told you everything, then there's always going to be a conflict between choosing the people with the best scores and the best performers on the one hand and choosing people in some other way. Okay? If, however, that's not the case, if how you perform depends both on your ability and on your score independently, then the trade-off is not obvious. Okay? So, let's, so this is the productivity line for group one. Okay? And so here I've just said a half of your productivity is your score and a half of it is your ability. And so the line for this group is shifted to the right okay, and up. And what it looks like will depend on the value of alpha. Alpha, in this case, is simply the weight that we attach to scores. All right. So now, how should we think about allocations? And there are three popular notions of justice that have appeared in the literature. One is that of equal opportunity. And the way I define this is using the Rawlsian definition which says that the expectations of those with the same abilities and aspirations should not be affected by their social class. Okay? Interpreted in the context of my model, it's saying that if two people have the same ability, they should have the same chances of getting the good job. Okay? The second notion is what I call meritocracy or efficiency, which says that individuals should be recruited to positions according to their attributes as relevant for performing the task in question. So the best person for the job is what I call meritocracy. And the third notion is what I call observable merit, which is this definition, but based only on things that you can observe. So in this case, if there are 25% of the jobs in the economy are valued jobs, then they should go to the 25% highest scorers in the economy, because that's all that we can observe. Okay. So However, if our measure, which is our score, is, has some error, if it doesn't tell us everything that we want to know, if you studied a lot of hard mathematics in school, but it wasn't really used when you were doing your job, and so the score in that sense is a, is, is a measure that has error to it, so if this has error, then these two are going to give you different results, meritocracy and observable merit, and in that case, Equal opportunity can enhance both equality and efficiency. So the idea of this to say that the purpose of equal opportunity is not, or the a result of equal opportunity allocations does not inevitably imply an efficiency cost. 
So let's see what these look like. And this is where this is computationally easy with the flat distribution. So suppose I look, these are the productivity curves. And suppose I'm looking at equal opportunity. Well, if a quarter of positions are valuable, equal opportunity would imply that I give them to the top quarter in each group. Okay? A score-based allocation would mean that I give them, in this case, it depends on the numbers you take, how big each group is uh, in the population, how big the difference in resources are, how productivity depends on these things. It will depend on the numbers. In this case, they go entirely to the group with resources. And the meritocratic allocation is not this allocation. It would give a larger share to group two, in this case, and a smaller share to group one, but it would be different from the score-based allocation. And the more general point is that there is a productivity loss that comes both from the score-based allocation and from your quota allocation. But it's not clear which one is bigger. So if the role of ability in performance, if the direct role of ability in performance is large, then alpha in my model is close to 0. And in this case, the score-based allocation does very well. There's a very small loss. On the other hand, uh, the, sorry, the equal opportunity does very well, the score base does badly, and the other way around if alpha is large. And so it really depends. Um, and I think part of my reason for emphasizing this is that it's believed that allocations on the basis of scores are efficient in some sense, and we're losing something, and then are we losing too much is usually the question. And what I'm arguing is that that's, it's too early to jump to that point. We have to see whether we really are in a position where there's a trade-off, if we're choosing between those two. OK, so now let me switch to what's visually easier to see. So now let's think about what happens with multiple groups. So we're moving very slowly towards the India, Indian case. We have only four. We, you know, we need to get to 4,000, but, but we're getting there. The, the idea is the same. So now if you have two groups, suppose you're in a situation where you either decide that the trade-off is valuable or where there isn't a trade-off and you decide on the quota system, now you can see that if you have two categories and multiple groups, then you've lost the equal opportunity. There's no way that you can get it with the quotas anymore. Okay? And if quotas were actually efficiency enhancing, they need not be efficiency enhancing anymore. They'll typically be a cost because you wanted the able people for efficiency, and the able people in the most disadvantaged groups now are getting thrown out. In addition, what you have is if you fill this space in, so if you really move from two to four to eight and you put more and more groups in there so that you can't see anything in the picture, what, what will be obvious is that the differences in disadvantage are going to be very close. And when it's close, it's really hard to figure out who belongs in one category and who belongs in another. So the Indian case, I argued, is problematic both because we have many more groups than categories, but also as a result, and for various other reasons, which are involved with the development of this particular scheduling strategy, there are going to be mistakes in classification. And so then groups very close to the margin and advantaged are really going to quite reasonably argue that they should have been disadvantaged. Not only that, even if you got it right, even if there are no classification errors, you'll have some leapfrogging. So there's a, there's a good, there are jobs that group, one group gets, a group very close to them, just slightly better off historically, doesn't get. And so this group will eventually do better than that one, and then the schedules that you draw, had drawn up are not going to be quite right. But if there are big gains to be got from being on the schedule, this group will argue very hard that it's still very disadvantaged. And there might be others much further to the right that say, well, you know, it depends on how you measure disadvantage. You don't have good measures. We're also disadvantaged. And so I argue that's part of what's happened in the Indian context. So let me, that's the first part. That's the model. So let me, let me look now to alternative representations of caste. And one of the reasons that caste is confusing uh, Didier, who's a very Fassin, who's a very well-read anthropologist, asked me one day, well, how does 4 match up with 4,000? What's the, you know, what does it mean? And the answer is simply that there are two alternative conceptions of caste that are closely connected. 
their origins are different, their, their purpose is different, but they're closely connected. The first is what one might call the ritual representation, and the other is the ethnographic representation. So the ritual representation is what one would call Varna, which is traced back to a Vedic hymn which says that the four castes, the Brahmans, the Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas, and the Shudras came respectively from the head, the arms, the thighs, and the feet of God. So that's a hymn. And then there was a text that was written, the Manusmriti, about 2,000 years ago, which outlined the duties of these different groups. So all that was written in terms of these four groups on the left. It was written in terms of the Varna. And there, were a whole, there was a large number of castes that were not considered in the Varna at all. They were considered outcasts. The ethnographic definition of caste is simply to think of caste as what people call you and you call yourself. And so, in a sense, caste under the Jati system is what an economist would call an equilibrium. Either somebody called you something and you agreed, or you called yourself something and somebody else agreed, but the particular structure at any point in time is just something that arises from this mutual agreement. And since people can call themselves anything, uh, you have a lot of different castes, very simply. Uh, so in 1881, uh, which was the time of the first census which enumerated caste in India, you had 1,929 1, castes and another 960 names which the census commissioner treated as synonyms or subcastes because either they were very close in spelling or there was other ethnographic information which related them very closely. Uh, so you had a lot of small groups and some large groups in these 2,000 castes. Uh, 206 of them had 100,000 people or more, 47 had a million or more, 21 had 2 million or more, uh, and sorry, I, this is the usual cut and paste problem that I thought I'd avoided, but I, I haven't. <laughs> it, it's supposed to be three. Three had more than 10 million, and the three were the Brahmins, the Kunbis, and the Chamars. The Chamars are, a scheduled, are the largest scheduled caste in India at the moment, and they also um, are the caste party that is in charge of the, gov uh, the government in the biggest state of the country, Uttar Pradesh. And so you had, in the Jati system, you had depressed classes, exterior castes, untouchables, or scheduled castes, depended on, depending on when you, were, when you were thinking about these things. And the two representations were closely connected because there was always an attempt by many different kinds of people to fit one into another. So you had all these castes, you had all these Jatis, and the question is, well, were you, did you belong to the second rung, or the third rung, or the first rung? And if you'd done very well, or if you moved from one place to another, could you make a claim to say you were actually in this and not in this? And so there was con constant contestation that was linked to mapping one set uh, into another set of categories. Um, so caste, wh where do these names come from? And so it's often said that caste was all about occupation, and it was about the division of labor. There was actually this very acrimonious debate between uh, B.R. Ambedkar, who was the champion of the untouchable caste in the 1930s, who was really fighting for their representation, and Gandhi. And Gandhi said, well, this is just a division of labor. And Ambedkar said, it's, not, it's got nothing to do with the division of labor. It's a division of laborers who are really all the same. Um, and so the idea was, was it really linked to occupation? And many of the names were based on occupation, but certainly not all of them. Um, so for example, the first row, you have a guala, who, which means a milkman, and these were cattle graziers. The second row, you have a hir. They were also cattle graziers, but it doesn't mean anything that people can figure out. Uh, the adhobi means a washerman. An ambatan also means a washerman, but it means it in Tamil, which is a different language. It's a South Indian language. A chamar means a leather worker. A musahar is this derogatory name that means a mouse eater. Um, and they were just agricultural laborers at the time that they were enumerated. Dubla just means weak, and they were field laborers. Bhangi means broken. So many of these names were derogatory, and they were just based on the system of power and somehow 
these two sides either agreeing or acquiescing, or one acquiescing to what they were called. Finally, Kalla is, means thief in Tamil, and the old Tamil literature talks about them as thieves. And they were actually rulers. They, they got prosperous enough, and they were rulers of Tamil kingdoms. So uh, Nicholas Dirks talks a lot about this, about how caste evolved. And with power went changes in caste names. So the set of names was therefore the shifting equilibrium of appellations given or taken and accepted by each side. Um, relatively small fractions actually practiced their traditional occupations. And the lower down in the caste hierarchy you went, the smaller the share that were actually practicing these occupations. So cobblers were regarded as lower down than washermen, for example. And fewer cobblers were cobblers than washermen were washermen, if you see what I mean. OK. So what are some of the factors that led to these, these large numbers of groups? One was language. And the big, so you have 14 languages, but you have two major language groups, the Indo-Aryan group and the Dravidian group. And so when you go across this border, you get a completely different set of names, which might equ equally well correspond to similar occupations. Um, this is a different map from 1901, which actually looks at the territorial distribution of caste. And so while in the top left-hand corner, you see that Brahmins were distributed across the country, and Chamars were distributed across a lot of North India, many of the other groups were very concentrated. And so these four maps refer to castes that were listed as military castes in different parts of the country. Then you had migration. So this is again from Eustace Kitts, who, who noted when he was making up this compendium that migrants into an area were often assigned a name which was neither their own name, which they called themselves, nor was it a name which people like them occupationally in the area called themselves, which is something different. So for example, he says that the Banjaras are names that they among themselves never think of using. It's a name given to them by others. And then he goes on to say, well, if you're a Banjara in the Deccan, you will call yourself Labana. In further south, you will call yourself Lambadi, and so on. So these names, that's why we have so many groups. One reason is language. Another is these changing economic fortunes. So in 1931, in the province of Bengal alone, there were 41 claims to new nomenclature. And most of these castes, again, they tried to map themselves into the Varna system. So they wanted a hyphenated name, the first part of it kept their caste name, and the second part of it said Brahman or Kshatriya. Um, and so in South India, for example, by the time of the 1931 census, the Shanars, who were the toddy tapping caste, and actually a lot of this did tap, to a lot of them did tap toddy, uh, which is going up these tall palm trees and uh, getting the juice of the palm tree, uh, this, which is, which is, which is then, if fermented, it can be had fermented or fresh. <laughs> and so if, if fermented, it's, the, it's, the, uh, it's country liquor. So they became Nadars. They changed their name to Nadars. And there were long petitions that actually came before this happened. And the Pali's, or agricultural rapelers, again, started being called as Vanikula Kshatriyas, or Kshatriyas of the fire race. Okay, so there was all this stuff going on. The Smiths of South India, they called themselves Vishwakarma Brahman. So there was this mapping that was going on constantly between Varna and Jati. The big difference was that before 1950, the castes that listed themselves as exterior castes protested their inclusion. So the argument was often, we shouldn't be listed as depressed classes. What changed after 1950 is that many of the formerly advantaged classes claimed they, that they should be treated as disadvantaged. And so these are just two. So two, the military castes that I showed you, two of these military castes are the Gujars of Rajasthan and the Jats of Rajasthan and Haryana. And so here is from the, new, from the Hindustan Times, a newspaper, uh, a daily newspaper in India. The Gujars of Rajasthan plan to stage protests in the capital yet again from October 6th, demanding scheduled tribe status for their community in the state. Earlier this year, the Gujars held the entire capital to ransom over the same issue. So these are very powerful groups that are claiming the status. Uh, then again, you have this year, there's been a lot of disruption because more than 1,000 trains have been canceled and others diverted because of the Jat community's agitation demanding quotas. Uh, 
Okay? So there's this sort of perverse demand for disadvantage that has set in with these caste classifications. So let's, let's then look at the numbers and actually see how people have done. So if we think back to this model of heterogeneity, is it really true that there's some groups within the scheduled castes who've done a lot better than others? Um, and so let's look at the period before preferential treatment came in first. Uh, this is from the 1891 and the 1931 census. So the first thing that hits you is really the enormous differences in literacy levels. These are just literacy levels. So it's the ability to read a letter and to write a reply in any vernacular language. And so you see that literacy rates varied from well below 1% for these castes at the bottom to about 16% for the Brahmins and for these writer classes for to 24%, I think, over there. And then between 1891 and 1931, there was quite a lot happening here, but there was very little happening here. And there was certainly nothing happening to the, there was no convergence going on. It wasn't as if people who started off low were somehow catching up. Um, what happened after that? So from 1961, we have literacy rates for the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes separately. And so what you find is that there was convergence after that. So at this point, uh, scheduled caste literacy is about a third of all India literacy. Um, and scheduled tribe is a bit lower. And here you have a gap of about 20%. So there was convergence after that. And so if you look at this picture, then things look pretty good. So the question is, were there unequal gains, again, within this group and this group? And that's, that's what I'd like to turn to now. So this is looking at the 20 largest scheduled castes. So looking at the individual groups within the scheduled caste category and looking at the 20 largest of these groups and looking at their progression through the school system. And you find that the gaps are really huge. Um, so if you're looking at primary school, then the Musahars, which I talked about as the mouse eaters, in, etymologically mouse eaters, uh, have, um, well, everything is just crunched up at the bottom. So they have primary school completion rates of less than 3%. Okay? They have secondary school completion rates of less than 0.1%. Okay? On the other hand, you have the... Uh, Chamars, which are here, they're the very large group within the scheduled caste. They're the largest group within the scheduled caste. They're somewhere in the middle. And then you have a group, a set of groups. A lot of these are in South India that are actually doing much better. So if you now think about what this means in terms of opportunity, suppose you have a quota of, you know, it was in proportion to their share in the population. So you have a quota of 16%. <coughs> You really have to think about the relative chances of this group here getting a seat in university relative to that one there. And these are very, very big. These differences are very big now. So even if you're thinking about 3% finishing high school relative to 0.1%, uh, you have this 30-fold difference in opportunities. And so that's, that's one thing um, I wanted to point out. So can we think in terms of different kinds of policies? And can we put them in the analytical framework we had? And one way to think about policies is to think about what they do to the resources that we had uh, put here before. And so you can think about public goods. So suppose you make schools available, then what they're doing is really shifting. Even when you have multiple groups, as you make schools available in areas that they didn't exist before, you're shifting this distribution of ability for the groups at the bottom towards the middle. Okay? And so then what you're going to have is more equal numbers beyond the score thresholds that you actually have. So even with the quotas in place, if you did nothing with these, you would still narrow the difference in the relative chances of groups within the scheduled castes. Um, and one of the things you find when you look at the scheduled caste data is that a given group does better if it's in a state where literacy is increasing faster, which is not at all surprising. 
So if you compare two states with equal literacy, then the group that's bigger does better. If you're comparing two states with very different literacy, even a small fraction in that state of the scheduled caste is going to make the scheduled caste do better. Um, so finally, I wanted to give you some evidence that it's not really evidence. They're just some numbers that I found very provocative when I first uh, looked at them. And I think they make a case for the public good story, uh, at least in combination with the quota story. So Kerala, it's a Western state in many senses of the word. It's in Southwest India. But it also has mortality and literacy outcomes that are comparable with most Western countries. So Kerala has been cited as the success story in terms of social outcomes. And if you go back to the density map that we had at the beginning, one of the interesting things about Kerala is it's very densely populated. But it's densely populated not in the sense of having a few large cities. It's densely populated in the sense of an urban continuum. And so if you, if you, this is a bit of a grubby map that I found. But if you look at this map, you find these are all the the, the big circles are the big towns, but you have a lot of little towns and a lot of villages that would be called towns if they were anywhere else. So they're villages of 10,000 people. And the, the thing about Kerala, I don't know if any of you have read Arundhati Roy's novel, The God of Small Things, but one of the things about Kerala is that it was an extremely casteist society. So in Kerala, for example, this is from Gurye's book, Caste and Class in India, you had these very definite rules. So in North India, typically a Brahmin could accept some kind of food from somebody else and not other kinds of food. And you know, there were rules, but they weren't that strict. In Kerala, a Nair, and this was the ruling community in Kerala, a Nair may approach an Ambudri Brahmin, but must not touch him, while a Tian must keep himself at the distance of 36 steps from the Brahmin, and a Pulayan may not approach him within 96 spaces. So Kerala was certainly not a place where caste did not exist. Okay? And yet, the scheduled castes in Kerala have the best outcomes in the country. And so you know, here's something that might be part of the story, at least. If you look at village size in Kerala, and you put it in four categories. This is from the 2001 census. Then you find, uh, sorry, this should be greater than. Then you find villages with greater than 6,000 people are 90% of the village population, of the population of villages in Kerala. Okay? Um, in the other South Indian states, there are only 4% of all villages have that many people. Now, if you look within this, large village category, you find that the probability of having a secondary school in your village is no different. It's 82% in the other southern states. It's 83% in Kerala. Okay? So the Kerala story seems to suggest that public goods matter. If you look at areas where it's easy to locate public goods, then populations seem to do better. So that's basically the story that public goods have been neglected so far, and they should be a much bigger part of the story than they have been. Um, but one, one could argue that, that group-based quotas were not really about, they weren't only about inequality. They were here and everywhere else about stigma. Uh, and so these are two quotes that are saying very similar things. One is from Ambedkar in India, talking about the untouchables. The other is from Dubois, talking about the US. And they're saying pretty much the second thing. Dubois says that the Negro race, like all races, is going to be saved by its exceptional men. Ambedkar says that if you find just some lawyers, doctors, and educated people among the Chamars, no one will look down upon them. So the idea was that of stigma. And so looking back on this after all these years, Robert Deliege, who's a Belgian anthropologist and has worked extensively on untouchables for many decades in India, has written a book, an edited book this year. Um, and in his chapter to it, the book is called From Stigma to Assertion. And in his introduction, he says, in modern India, as opposed to some other India, uh, it is not relative purity that lies at the basis of caste struggles. 
Castes now fight because they have to compete for limited economic and political resources. A system that is based on the recognition of caste cannot lead to its suppression. And so, in a nutshell then, what I've tried to say is that given the particular context, and that's where it's a particular argument, given the particular context, social context, it would have been very hard for affirmative action to work. And I don't think it did, not for the purposes of inequality. It might have done other things. And so it might be time to move away from scheduling caste. Maybe we should just forget about it and make sure everyone has a school and a hospital and clean water and so on. I'll stop there. Thank you. Should I stay there? Uh, yeah, why don't you stay there? We have time for a few minutes of questions. Helen? So that's an interesting question. I mean, there's certainly some that do. And uh, for most things, I'm usually in a minority. And I think that's probably the case there as well. But what, what's interesting is in 2007, we did, this, we did this survey in Uttar Pradesh, which now is ruled by a big scheduled caste party. And we asked people two kinds of questions. We said, OK, there are all these parties out there. Which party do you think does the most for the scheduled castes? So here's 1,000 rupees of fake money. Uh, how would each party distribute them among the different castes? Um, and then we asked them who they would vote for. And what was interesting is that while the Brahmins and other groups in Uttar Pradesh seemed to vote for parties that they reported as giving them more, in their, in their view of the world, it was, it was this fake money across bins, many of the scheduled castes voted for the scheduled caste party, even though their own report didn't seem to suggest that they were giving them more. So uh, there, there are certainly, I mean, and I think there are large numbers of scheduled castes which, who cannot think about voting for a non-scheduled caste party if there's a viable scheduled caste candidate. And it doesn't really have to work with good governance or good transfers. Um, and so I think there are people who think this way, but I think there are people who don't. And thinking, not thinking this way is not just a result of some naivety. It's uh, disagreeing with open eyes, so to say. So and I think that's part of the problem. That's part of the whole I, you know, obstacle of caste-based politics. Hank? Yeah, I, I was very intrigued by your last table, which seemed to show what, what I think is, is somewhat common in developing countries, that there's much more resources in the cities than in the rural areas. And what you were doing with your case study was saying, look, this happened to be one area of the country where many of the scheduled castes, castes lived in um, the, the urban area as opposed to in those other South Indian <coughs> provinces, states. And I'm wondering nationally, are the scheduled case disproportionately in rural areas? So the scheduled castes are not. The scheduled tribes are. OK. Um, so are you, are you proposing that what we do is give more resources to the rural areas? Yes, I am. Yes. I'm saying not only, well, not even as a total number of resources, but more resources that really matter right at the bottom. So there are a lot of resources going in. There are you know, roads being built. There are lots of things going on. There are useless things being built and broken down. So there are lots of resources going there. But resources to you know, middle schools and villages would make a big difference, um, I think. Thank you. <clears throat> when I was growing up, which was a long time ago, uh, I understood the caste system to be Brahmas at the top touchables at the bottom. You were born in it. You lived in it. You never could get out of it. What happened to that old category? 
Uh, well, it's still, I mean, the Brahmins will still say the Brahmins are at the top and the, the untouchables are at the bottom. And if you, had to, if you had to create a ranking, you would still do that and there'd be a lot of ambiguity in the middle. The question is not whether the ranking has changed, but whether it's relevant at all, whether anybody cares or not. And one of the things that Deliesh finds over the years is that neither group seems to be that bothered. Um, so if you, I, you know, there's this very nice novel by Rohinton Mystery, it's called A Fine Balance, where it's actually interesting. There's this, there's this group of leather workers, the Chamars, in that village, and they're very pleased because one of their sons has decided not to do leather work and has become, has become a tailor. And of course, the higher ups in the village really object to this, but he's somehow managed. And then someone who's a cleaner comes to get his clothes stitched. And the family says, oh, you can't possibly let them come near the house. So there was a lot of stigma within the, and this was written during the emergency. Now, whether it portrayed what was going on then or, or something much earlier. But what certainly happened over time, and maybe that's part of the big advantage of reservations, is that it's put people together. And so the hierarchy still exists, but I don't know if people care about it as much. Some certainly do, but uh, not everyone. Jean? This was really, really interesting and, and very informative. Um, how would you deal with the question of the, the stigma that you talk about in regard to the resources that you want to distribute? Wouldn't those resources also be limited by these hierarchical uh, divi social divisions in the society? Could you stop that from happening? I mean, it, it, it seems to me what you're suggesting is that um, Resource, a distribution of resources could open the possibilities for greater equality among these groups, and that's preferable to affirmative action, which is addressing the question oh, of, of discrimination based on either uh, self-ascription of difference or attribution of difference. But how would you deal with the fact that resources are often distributed on the basis of those perceived differences? Yes, that's certainly valid, and there will be, for sure. And one of the interesting things there is to think about primary schooling. So as long as resources are scarce, the more powerful are going to get them. <laughs> but if you just make them not scarce, and you just you know, try to make everybody get them, so uh, you know, until the 1970s, primary schools were scarce. And now every village has a primary school, and the big challenge is a secondary school. So I think if you just increase them enough so that there are, there are no contests over them, then, um, and so the question is really, you know, there's always going to be contests over something, but some of the numbers were there to indicate that some of these groups aren't getting into primary school. Um, and so, you know, of course, they, they're, going to be, they're going to be unequally distributed, but on the other hand, what's happening with the quotas, and, and I don't think I spent enough time saying this, is that with the quotas, depending on how much efficiency you're losing. You, so you're thinking about policies that share a pie, but make it smaller, mm -hmm. and policies that make a pie bigger. And one of the things that's emerged from the enormous amount of research that's taken place on education is just that the returns to education in poor countries are very, very high. They would be higher than on any mutual fund you can think of. <laughs> and yeah, Leon Levy might have got a higher return, I'm sure, but you know, it's not as if, uh, it's not as if the, market the market returns are extremely high to education. So you would be making the pie bigger as well as maybe having this imperfect distribution. But sure, it would be imperfect. I just keep thinking in comparison of that the quality of schools also really matters. I it mean, matters I can't a help lot. thinking about New York public schools. And it's much harder to measure. Yeah. And I think once we get to the point where schools are everywhere, then we'll have to start worrying about quality. But right now, it's the construction. Derek? Oh, yeah. Um, I was struck by the number, the several times when you brought back to African American, the struggle uh, in the states uh, to achieve equality through affirmative action. And um, I, was, I was curious how much uh, that's a topic in India, because I know that Gandhi was an inspiration to King. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of curious whether this, because I don't know how much this model is known in the States or if anything is known or much is known about it, what's going on in India now. And also the question about, um, th and also this question which is tied in with it about um, 
about self-identification uh, as being an oppressed group and the fact that what you mentioned, which was curious, which was that at the beginning people did not want to be mentioned in this model and now people are, uh, are, are protesting and making their voice heard to be mentioned in this way. So how much do they think about things outside? And almost n not at all. Um, and part of, part of what I wanted to do when I, when I first came here this year was really to think about affirmative action in a comparative perspective. And then it just seemed that the two countries were so different that I would be setting myself up for failure. And so I stuck with what I, what I knew better. But one of, you know, because both seem to have gone too far in different directions. And the middle space just doesn't seem to be there. So there isn't a, there isn't a space to talk about distributing towards groups in the US. And there doesn't seem to be space to talk about anything else in India. And there has to be some place in the middle. Um, but one of the things that the Indian case has achieved, I think, is that redistribution is acceptable rhetoric. It's acceptable political rhetoric. And often it just stays as rhetoric. But I think that's an important distinction, that reducing poverty still has to be on every election agenda, on every party platform, even if nothing is done about it. But you know, so gradually, occasionally, someone will come in who'll want to do something about it, and then that gives them the space to do that. And that's part of what's interesting to me about the, the contrast between the two countries. Um, but yes, I think if each had been looking at each other more, we might have had more middle ground. Uh, yes. you don't eliminate the caste system, will the expectations of what happens after be thwarted in a sense? Because the job market, how does that work? Is that still going to be defined by caste? And therefore, you would not be able to do anything with this change unless you could change the entire system. So maybe you could talk a little bit about yeah. what happens once you get there. With the education. Uh, so this brings me back to what Derek was saying. There, there's an interesting set of studies which were done in exactly the same way in the US and in India. So researchers have been going across a little bit more than uh, popular opinion, uh, where they send out false resumes. So they send out resumes with false names, and some names are typically African-American names. And again, they do that in India, where you have caste names, so it's easy to recognize caste. And they do find discrimination on the job market. So they, even, if you, even if you level the playing field as far as opportunity in education is concerned, you still have discrimination in the job market. The, the problem is that the quotas seem to be, so then the question is, what can you do to get rid of caste? The problem is, as, as Deliege says, that the quotas are sort of reinforcing the notion of caste rather than getting rid of it. So, you know, maybe that'll be slow, maybe it'll take a long time. But the point is not really how long it takes us to get there, it's that we're moving in the wrong direction. Um, I don't think I'm bothered because it seems that. Uh, it seems that basically you accept the uh, uh, extended existence of the caste system as uh, uh, something which is given and uh, which is not going to change. Now, of course, certainly the people at the independence, uh, Dr. Ambedkar, but also Nehru, Gandhi, and many others, uh, thought that uh, India uh, in some way would be rid of this. Uh, and now, personally, I quite, un quite understand that uh, it's very complicated from an anthropological point of view. and. I don't have an opinion about how uh, you know, these categories of a traditional society can evolve. But it seems to me that, uh, again, you think this is given, it's not going to change, and then uh, you uh, try to design or to discuss the allocation of resources. But uh, in, partic in particular, an aspect is that uh, the, the problem of caste is not only uh, economic access, it's also, uh, at the bottom, uh, constant humiliation, a discrimination which is not economic and so on. Yeah. So, so that's a hard question. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think about which sense I take caste as given. 
So in a sense, I don't take any particular structure of caste is given at all. In fact, my point is that because it's fluid, it's hard to classify disadvantage right. But the point here is that if you allow for a system where group identity determines transfers, then some avatar of the caste system will come into place in the sense that there will be an advantage from claiming particular group status as opposed to some other group status. You can call that a caste system. You can call that a communal system. But if we didn't transfer at all to groups, then I think it's more likely that a caste system would become less relevant. It's, it's already becoming less relevant, but I think we would move further in that direction. I, I know there are other questions, but let me propose that they be moved to the coffee bar where there's about to be a reception. Uh, for now, let me uh, invite you to join me in thanking Rohini for a fascinating lecture. Thank you.